Hello, and today we're going to look at some mesh analysis examples. We have one right here that we can work through. Remember the trick with mesh is we're focusing on Kirchhoff's voltage law, making loops and then doing voltage summations around those loops. So here we have two obvious loops. We have uh, one right here we'll call this loop I1 and then we have one back here we'll call this loop I2. Now remember the goal here is to get all components in a loop we want to make the minimum number of smallest possible loops and we are arbitrarily setting them all to be clockwise this will make setting up signs and so forth a little bit easier. So the first thing we do is coming to loop number one over here we're going to do our KVL summations. So what we see, first off, minus to plus, remember that's going to be a rise, we see that as positive. So we see this E1, and then we see drops across inductor L1, resistor 1, we see the second source, now this is going plus to minus, so that actually appears as a negative value, right? Here we're coming in minus out plus. Here we're going in plus out minus. So we show up negative for that. And then finally we come through R2, which is plus to minus, like so, and we're back to ground. All right? So these two sources, we put those off on one side because they're constants. And now we can talk about the drops that we see on the other components. So that's going to be the drop on L1 plus the drop on R1 plus the drop on R2. Now we can write those in terms of their Ohm's law equivalence. So what do we see over here for the uh, first couple of components L1 and R1? Well the only current that's passing through there would be I1. So we can say basically that I1 is passing through XL1 and R1. All right. And then we have this R2 element, but that has two currents going through it. I1's coming down, I2's going up. So those are meshing currents, they're fighting currents. In other words, there's a differential current that's flowing through there. Okay, so we will add on R2 times that differential current, I1 minus I2. Now we have to simplify this. All right, uh, let's collect up some terms. I'm going to leave the E1, E2 over here. All right, what do we have in terms of I1 terms? Well, we've got the R1, the JXL, and we also have... Uh, this R2 term over here. So we're going to lump those all together. We'll put the reals first. So we have an R1 plus the R2 plus the J X of L. And that's all times I1. And then we just subtract off the I2 R2 term. Right? So that's minus R2 I2. All right, now we can plug in the numbers. E1 is specified as 9 at an angle of 0. E2 is specified as 12 at an angle of minus 90. R1 is 80 ohms. R2 is 20 ohms. And Jx of L is specified as J20. And then continuing, R2 is 20 ohms. So we have a negative 20 ohms times I2. All right. So that's essentially our first equation. Um, we just need to really simplify things just a little bit. You know, 80 plus 20 plus J20. This piece will turn into 100 plus J20. And if we uh, combine the 9 at 0 and the uh, 12 at a negative 90, we subtract those we'll wind up with a combined value of 15 at an angle of 53.1. Okay, so that's basically our first equation. We're good there. 
Now let's turn our attention to the second equation, the second loop, the I2 loop. What do we have over there? Well, as we go through here, I'm just going to start from ground up. We're going to see a plus to minus ground up on R2. Um, the reference polarity on E2 is minus to plus. Then we have the drop on the X of C, that will be plus to minus. And then finally the drop on X of L, number 2. All right, so going around that loop, the constant value that we see, the uh, E2 value, shows up positive because again the current's going in the minus and out the plus. So we just show that up here as just a plain old positive E2. Now notice how that in this loop E2 is positive, but in the first loop E2 showed up negative. Right? So in, in the I1 loop the current's going into the plus, out of the minus. In the I2 loop it's going into the minus and then out of the plus. And that makes all the difference in the world. All right. Anyway, continuing, um, we're going to add up our potentials here. So the, um, the one uh, fixed pair, so to speak, would be the I2 through the X sub C and the X sub L2. That's the only current flowing through there. So we can just put those together and say here is minus J X sub C plus J X sub L number 2. Okay, that sees I2 as a current. And then we have the drop produced across R2. What is that? Well, the R2 drop winds up being, uh, again, a pair of meshing currents, just like it was in the first case. We have I1 coming down and I2 coming up. Now, in this case, because we're in the I2 loop, we look at I2 as being the positive, right? That's the, the reference direction, if you will, and I1 is fighting that. So we're going to write that as I2 minus I1, right? We're in the I2 loop, so, so I2 wins. Think of it that way. So we just say that's plus the drop on R2, which is Ohm's law R2 times the current, which is I2 minus I1. I'll do the same thing. We'll expand this out, collect up some terms and kind of go from there. All right. So our I, I1 term, we'll put those first. The I1 term, that's going to be a negative R2. And then for our uh, I2 term, we have um, the R2, we have the X of L number 2, and the, and the minus J X of C. So we can put those all together. All right. Put our real first here. And then doesn't really matter after that. Uh, minus j x sub c plus j x sub l number 2. And all that is multiplied by i2. Okay, now we can um, plug our values in and simplify it a little bit. So the e2 is 12 at an angle of minus 90. The R2 is 20 ohms, and we'll just repeat that over here. The minus J X sub C is uh, 75. The minus J X sub L number 2 is J50. And we can just combine up a few things, all right? So, uh, Clearly over here we've got a, a J50 and a minus J75, so that's going to give us a minus J25 for this. And there's really nothing else to simplify. So we now have our uh, uh, two equations, all right? Coming back over here, I'll just copy this back down. 15 at an angle of minus 53.1 equals the 100 plus J20 times I1 minus 20 I2 and then this equation which is 12 at an angle of minus 90 minus 20 times I1 plus 20 minus J25 for the I2. Now do we have diagonal symmetry? Yes, we do.
Uh, there's our diagonal. We come off from the sides and we see uh, minus 20 and minus 20 for those two elements. Okay, all right. Now we would take these two equations, solve them in our manner of choosing, if you will, and we would come up with two currents. So turns out that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I1 will work out to 0.1785 at an angle of 19.9 degrees and the uh, second current I2 that works out to uh, about twice the value 0.3529 at an angle of negative 21.4 degrees. All right. Now, let's say we want to go back in. I have these two currents. We want to go back in and check some voltages and so on and so forth, right? Um, how do we go about doing that? For example, and I've got some nodes labeled here. Here's point A and point B and point C. So let's say we want to find out, oh, I don't know, uh, VC. Right. What is the, the voltage from C to ground? Well, by inspection, you can see that that is the voltage across the inductor. All right. So we could write a little formula for that. What's the current through it? Well, the only current through the inductor, inductor number two, is I2. So that's just I2, and that's going to be multiplied by the inductive reactance. All right. X sub L number two, which happens to be the uh, J50. So if we plug the numbers in there, all right, our I2, 0 0.3529 minus 21.4 times uh, J50, or uh, 50 at an angle of 90, if you prefer. All right, um, and we'll come up with an appropriate value. And VC just happens to work out to 17.64 volts. Oops. At an angle of... 68.6 degrees, all right? Now, um, if we wanted to, that, that one's fairly straightforward, if we wanted to, we could also find something like uh, VB, okay? Um, how do we go about doing that? Well, you have a couple options to find VB. I always recommend doing the least amount of work on these things. Uh, perhaps the easiest way you might immediately think, let's go this way. I've got E2 in this drop. Um, but you can also go this way. Now, which one's easier? Eh, I don't know, six one, half dozen of the other, right? Um, I already know this one current. All I have to do is essentially the same computation, except um, it's driving through the capacitor and the inductor, all right? So if I did that same thing to get VB, I could say, well, that's I2 times the JXL2 uh, plus the negative J X sub C. All right, so I'll just plugging those in. We already know what that I2 current is. 3529 at minus 21.4. And then um, this value here, the, the uh, uh, two reactances, You've got a, a J50 and a, um, a minus J75, which is just going to give us uh, minus J25, right? We found that actually back there. And running that through, we'll find that we get uh, just shy of 9 volts. It's actually 8.823 at an angle of negative 111.5. Four. All right. Now, you might wonder, okay, hey, my VC is bigger than my VB, but there's a drop, right? Well, don't forget, that's capacitive reactants, that's inductive reactants. And in this case, they, um, not completely, but there's a lot of cancellation going on here, right? You got a minus J75 and a, a 
plus J50. In fact, if we actually calculated the voltage across the capacitor, you know, it would be even bigger than this. Of course, it would be 180 degrees out of phase because of capacitor versus inductor, right? They're each 90 degrees out of phase with a resistor, one positive, one negative. So those two elements are going to be 180 degrees out of phase with each other. So yeah, it makes perfect sense that VB is a smaller magnitude than the VC is, all right? Your other option, your other way of finding VB, all right, is to kind of come down this way. Um, what do you have there? Well, um, you have an E2 and you have a drop across R2, okay? So um, we could simply find the voltage drop across R2. Let me put that over here. And that would be the 20 ohms times the current through it. Well, what is the current through it? Well, if I'm going to use this polarity, plus, minus, plus, minus, then I would say that's I1 minus I2. All right. Plug those numbers in, grind this out, we'll get the drop on this. Then we can just add the value of E2 to it, which is the, um, the uh, 12 at minus 90. Another option is, and this is perhaps out of all of them the longest way home, is to kind of go this way, all right? Uh, what is um, VB? Well, one way of looking at VB, thinking of it in terms of KVL, is you could say, well, that's E1 minus the drop on these two elements, okay? So in other words, it's I1 times the quantity uh, R1 plus Jx of L1. Okay, you could do it that way. Uh, however you do it, I mean, there's three ways, right? You kind of go this way, or you go this way, or you go this way. Um, you're going to have to come up with the same value. You're going to have to come up with this 8.8 uh, .8 volts at negative uh, 111 degrees, all right? And essentially, that's the way we work through this, is um, we figure out, the vo for any given component's voltage, we figure out what's the current through it. It's either going to be a singular current, as in the case here, 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 and here, or it's going to be a pair of currents, meshing currents, where it's one minus the other. And the only trick, quote unquote, is to just determine what your reference polarities are. So like in this case, as I said, if we think of VB as being the reference positive above ground, and we're going to use this plus to minus on E2, I might as well go with the plus to minus on R2. Then I can just add those potentials together. Right, so we wind up doing this, I1 minus I2. Now if you had actually said, oh, it's I2 minus I1, because that has a minus to plus top to bottom polarity, you'd wind up subtracting that off. But you'd get the same answer, because you're really just subtracting a negative, all right? In other words, doing it that way, this phase angle is 180 degrees out compared to doing it the other way. So you have some flexibility here, you just have to be consistent with it, okay? So this is the basic idea, all right? Just to recap, we create our loops, then we just go through and do uh, KVL summations, all right? So we have our sources. We like to get the sources by themselves because they're constants. We know them. Then we can just do the uh, Ohm's Law sorts of versions. In other words, voltage equals current times some impedance, right? Resistance or reactance. Um, we build those up. We write them in terms of their Ohm's Law equivalents. Okay, um, and when we have a, uh, a component that has meshing currents, the current we're currently looking at, in other words, the, the current loop, the current uh, loop current, that we take is positive, and the meshing one we take is negative. All right, so here we are in loop one. I1 is positive, I2 is negative. Over here in the second equation for the second loop, we had the same issue with R2 and we see I2 is taken as the positive and I1 is taken as the negative. All right, so that's your basic idea. And then once you get the equations, check for diagonal symmetry, solve them in your preferred method. You come up with the two mesh currents and then the voltages are either a single mesh current, like those four, or a meshing pair and you just have to decide one minus the other. And we can kind of call it a day at that point. Now, in the follow-up video to this, we're going to look at the same problem, 
but we're going to approach it in a slightly different way. We're going to use an inspection technique, and this calls to mind what we did with Nodal. Right? There was a general sort of uh, approach that would work with uh, a variety of, of different kinds of sources, right? current sources, voltage sources with Nodal. And then there was this um, sort of inspection method where the limitation was we just have to have current sources. And we could, just by inspecting the circuit, build our equations directly. Right? Very quick, very efficient. Well, it turns out there's an inspection method for mesh as well. And like Nodal, there is also a limitation to it in that the version for mesh requires just voltage sources. So we'll take a look at that next time.